This video is sponsored by Hunt a Killer. With the current chaos around us showing little signs of letting up, I realized I needed to think outside of the box when it came to entertaining myself and my family. Turns out, thinking outside of the box led me to the inside of another box, this one with a deadly secret inside. Hunt a Killer is a monthly subscription service in which you'll sift through piles of documents, evidence, audio recordings, and case files, eliminating suspects and identifying murder weapons until you crack the case and catch the killer, like a real-life detective. Hunt a Killer combines all my favorite activities into one amazing and multifaceted experience, with quality-looking and authentic-feeling clues and layers upon layers of mystery. So far, I've cracked two cases, one over a series of wonderful date nights with my partner and one with my trusty daughter as my sidekick. The best thing is that Hunt a Killer gets us away from mindlessly staring at screens and back into meaningful and interesting conversations. And for those who watch our channel in hopes of resolutions for victims everywhere, Hunt a Killer donates a portion of the proceeds of every box to the Cold Case Foundation, an organization dedicated to helping solve real life cases. Be it alone, on a date night, or with family, this box is sure to provide hours of intrigue. For 20% off your first box, just visit huntakiller.com slash Merck and enter code Merck at checkout. Again, visit huntakiller.com slash Merck and make sure to use Merck for a 20% discount on your first box. Thank you, Huntakiller, for sponsoring this video. Denise Flum was an 18-year-old girl living with her parents, Judy and David, and her younger sister, Jenny, in Connorsville, Indiana. On the 27th of March, 1986, Denise attended a party on a farmland. As it was spring break, most students were off, and what was supposed to be a small gathering of friends turned into several hundred teenagers. Denise returned to her house that night, but would forget her purse at the party. The next day, on the 28th of March in 1986, Denise left her home to retrieve her purse from the farmland. She'd asked her friends to accompany her, but they were busy. She also asked her sister, but she couldn't accompany her as she had softball practice, so Denise decided to go alone. She was not carrying her identification, or the carrying case or cleaning solution for her contact lenses when she left her home that day. She would never return back home. Her mother Judy later said, we're not sure why she didn't want to go alone. She was fearless ever since she was a child, so for her to be uncomfortable to go back to the site of the party is unnerving. Something wasn't right. The owner of the farmland said Denise never arrived at his property. A friend had reportedly seen her at 2 p.m. at the Fashion Bug Store on 30th Street. Later that day, a distant cousin of Denise's, who had gone to school with her, returned her purse to Judy. When Denise did not arrive back home by that evening, her parents reported her missing. The following day, Denise's cream-colored 1981 Buick Regal was found by a farmer alongside Tower Road, a rural gravel road east of Glenwood, Indiana. He stated that the car had been there since between 12.30 p.m. and 1.15 p.m. the day she went missing. He said he didn't report it to police earlier as he thought the car belonged to mushroom hunters. The area where her car was found was in a rural area across the county from where Denise lived and about three miles away from the farmland. Her family stated that they could not think of any reason that she would have gone to that area. There was no indication that a struggle had taken place at the scene. Judy said that Denise had recently broken up with her boyfriend of three years and she was trying to be more social. The police carried out searches using canine as well as helicopters, however, nothing would turn up. There were multiple suspects according to the police, but there was not enough evidence to charge anybody. Years would go by with no update in the case. Then, 34 years later, in 2020, Sean M. McClung was arrested and charged with voluntary manslaughter of Denise. Sean was Denise's ex-boyfriend of three years. He had been questioned by the police previously, but had claimed that Denise was still alive, but more recently he admitted to killing her. Sean pleaded not guilty during a court appearance and his bond was set at $500,000. It is still unclear how Denise died and her body has never been found. The investigation into her homicide is still ongoing. Esther Lucille Westenbarger was a 51-year-old woman who had just recently moved to Kokomo, Indiana from Fostoria, Ohio to be closer to her family. She had just gotten a hefty buyout package from Chrysler and was looking to enjoy some time with her family. On November 12, 2009, she went out with some new friends at Hosier's Bar. 
She parked her gold 2005 Cadillac CTS, bearing Ohio personalized registration plate Ms. Esther, at the bar. She then walked to Miller's Tavern in the area. At around 1.30 a.m., she left the bar and walked on foot towards her car. This was the last time she would ever be seen. The next day, Esther had planned a surprise party for her mother, who was turning 73 on November 14th. However, when the family tried calling her, they could not reach her ahead of the party. They visited her home, but no one was there. She was eventually reported missing. Police launched a search investigation and found that her car was missing as well. The people with whom Esther was bar hopping with were questioned, but to no avail. There would be no updates or any leads in the case for 11 years. Then, on June 17, 2020, Howard County 911 Dispatch Center received a call from a local fisherman stating that they believed they saw a car covered in algae at the bottom of a retention pond. The police pulled out the car from the pond and found human remains inside. The vehicle was identified as a gold 2005 Cadillac CTS bearing Ohio registration plates Ms. Esther. An autopsy performed by a forensic pathologist confirmed that they were the remains of Esther Lucille Westenbarger. Foul play is not suspected in her death, and it is believed that Esther had too much to drink and accidentally drove her car into the retention pond. Blanca Otero Alvarez was born in Quitalipi, Argentina in 1952. Both her parents were Spanish, and in 1973, her and her two brothers, along with their parents, would move back to Sayalisas de Cibero, Spain. Blanca was working as an elementary school teacher in Argentina when she moved to Spain. However, she would have a hard time finding a job as a teacher in Spain, so she decided to change her career and move to the city of Lyon, where she found a job in Renfe, a railway company in Spain. She would visit her family regularly at their family home. But sometime in 1995, Blanca, then 43 years old, would disappear and never return to her home in Lyon. When her family didn't hear from her for a few days, they decided to visit her home in Lyon. When they arrived at her apartment, they couldn't find her. They asked her friends and colleagues, but no one had seen her. She had left behind all of her belongings in her apartment. However, the family wouldn't report her missing until two years later, in 1997. According to one of her brothers, she was not reported missing because their father, quote, didn't want to report her missing. Shortly after she was reported missing, the police located her to be living in Gijon. However, Blanca did not want to contact her family, and as she was an adult, the police could not force her to get in touch with her family. Her mother and the two brothers decided to visit her in Gijon. They found out where she was living, but when they arrived at her apartment, she was already gone. The family would not hear from her for the next eight years. Then, in 2005, Blanca would send a letter to her family with a current photo of herself. In the letter, she said that she was fine and asked for her father to forgive her for leaving. She also wrote that someday she would get in touch with her brothers. Her father would pass away a year later in 2006. Her family hoped that she would get in touch with them soon, but years would pass and they would hear nothing from her, leading them to believe that she may have died. In 2013, one of the brothers found a police sketch of an unidentified middle-aged dead woman found on Camelo Beach, Santander. The unidentified woman was known as La Dama di Camelo and was found in 2001. The family believed the woman to be Blanca, however, a DNA test ruled her out. To this day, La Dama di Camelo remains unidentified. In September of 2020, a 68-year-old woman named Ivo was reported missing in Pola de Ciero, Asturias, Spain, by her neighbors after not hearing from her or seeing her for a few days. The police tried ringing Ivo's doorbell, but no one answered. The door was locked from the inside, indicating that the woman was in the house. They finally broke into the house to find Eva sitting on the floor, unable to move due to a problem in her legs. She was conscious, but extremely dehydrated and disoriented. She was transferred to a HUCA hospital. In the meantime, the police tried finding her family to let them know of her condition. However, to their surprise, the identity by which she was known among the neighborhood did not coincide with the data that appeared both in the address and in the UHCA database. Her identity was found to be fake, and her true identity was revealed to be Blanca Otero Alvarez. 
Blanca had been living in Pola di Siero for years under the name Eva. She had made money by babysitting, taking care of pets, and house cleaning. In the recent years, her health had been deteriorating. Blanca's family has been contacted. Blanca's mother is now 90 years old and lives in a nursing home in Gijon. No information was given on why she initially disappeared or the motivations behind her eluding the grasp of her family for so many years. Charlene Cheryl Hammock was a young 18-year-old woman living with her parents in Thomaston, Georgia. In fall of 1981, Cheryl decided to join a touring fair to earn some money to see the country. She would call her family three or four times a week after joining the fair. One day, though, she told the family that she had met someone and was planning on moving to Texas. She said she would return at Christmas and that they should leave a gift for her under the tree. Cheryl would stop calling after that, and the family got worried when they didn't hear from her for over a week. She would never return to her family to celebrate the fabled Christmas she spoke of. A few months later, her family received Cheryl's wallet and driver's license in the mail, but with no return address. It was at this point that her mother decided to report her missing to the police. Despite the investigation into her disappearance, the family would receive no updates on her case for years. In October of 1981, the body of an unidentified woman was found beside a small dirt lane entrance to a cornfield in Dixie, Georgia. The victim was covered slightly with freshly cut branches and foliage to hide her. The police determined that she had been stabbed in the abdomen and strangled. There was no identification found at the crime scene. They determined that the victim was a young white woman, about five feet, two inches tall, weighing about 105 pounds with shoulder brown hair and hazel eyes. They estimated that she was somewhere between 18 and 24 years old. Without any leads as to the woman's identity, she was buried in a grave with a headstone which read, known only to God. She also had a forensic sketch, which the police drew during the investigation, carved into the slab. Soon, a witness told the police that a motorhome with Alabama license plates had been seen near the crime scene. Police found the motorhome and arrested a man named George Newsom. The motorhome was later found to be stolen from another state. Police searched the motorhome and found a rope that they believed matched the one which was used to strangle the young lady. They also found the knife that was used to murder her. Initially, George refused to cooperate with investigators and said he had nothing to do with the murder. About a week after his arrest, George escaped from the Brooks County Jail and remained a fugitive for two years. He was finally caught on January 13, 1983. Upon his recapture, he confessed to her murder but did not disclose her identity. George said that he had met the woman at a traveling fair in Tallahassee, Florida. He said that he had argued with her about another man and killed her in Quitman. He pled guilty and was sentenced to life in prison. He died on August 10, 1998 from natural causes, but he never disclosed the young woman's identity. The case went cold for three decades. The police tried everything to try and identify the woman, but to no avail. Then, on Halloween in 2018, 37 years after her murder, the police received a tip from a woman named Kayla Bishop that the unidentified woman resembled her childhood friend, known to her as Cheryl Hammock. She told them that Cheryl had gone missing in 1981 after traveling with a fair. Kayla had seen the sketch on Facebook and had contacted the police. Following the tip, the police contacted Cheryl's surviving family members, her mother and her sisters. The circumstances surrounding Cheryl's disappearance provided by the family members were consistent with their investigation. The victim's body was exhumed and an extensive DNA test was done for over one and a half years against the samples provided by Cheryl's family members. On January 9, 2020, the unidentified woman was finally confirmed to be Sherlene Cheryl Hammock. The case was finally solved after 37 years and her family could finally get some closure. Billy Feigner was just 22 years old when he went missing. Born in Brooklyn, Billy had been getting into serious trouble living there. In 1984, his parents decided to send him to a horse ranch in California, owned by a former neighbor, in hopes of separating him from bad influences. He lived and worked there for some time, but in late 1984 and 1985, he seemingly disappeared, and the family never got to find out what happened to him. 
On October 27, 1985, a father and son were walking on a ranch in Parker County in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, hoping to find a place to potentially build a new home, when they stumbled upon skeletonized remains. They immediately notified the police. The remains had been buried in a shallow grave which was partially covered by foliage and had been dug up by animals. The victim was believed to be between the ages of 15 and 20. He had been shot to death and his clothes, including a pair of gas blue jeans and a Union Bay white fleece jacket, had been strewn across the area. Although clothes were present at the scene, police were unable to find any identification. Sheriff's deputies began checking missing persons reports, but couldn't find anyone matching the description. The victim was given the name of John Parker Doe. Years would go by and the case grew cold. Over the years, authorities tried everything from facial reconstruction, DNA phenotyping, and genealogical testing to try and identify the young victim. In 2018, DNA was extracted and sent to Parabon Nano Labs to determine the victim's characteristics, which were previously unknown. Through DNA phenotyping, John Parker Doe was finally given a face. He had fair skin, brown or hazel eyes, brown or black hair, zero or few freckles, and was of European ancestry. This disputed their earlier assumptions that the victim was of mixed race. With the new information, a more accurate 3D facial reconstruction was made, but it still did not generate any leads. CC Moore from Parabon Nano Labs uploaded the victim's DNA to GED Match, and over the next 18 months, hundreds of hours were spent to try and find any relative of John Parker Doe. Soon, they found a potential first and second cousin. However, the cousins were found to be adopted and did not know their biological family. The genealogists then tried to find biological parents of the adoptees to be able to find some lead for John Parker Doe eventually. They were able to find a possible birth father of one of the adoptees, but they couldn't confirm it through DNA as the man was already deceased. Fortunately, one of the man's biological sons agreed to take a DNA test and it was uploaded to GED Match. In a breakthrough, it was found that he was the first cousin to John Parker Doe. C.C. Moore then built a family tree and searched for a male between the ages of 15 and 20 that had gone missing. She found one name in the New York birth index that seemed like it could be a match. No records were available for him after he entered his early 20s. His name was Billy Feigner. Authorities soon tracked down Billy's parents who were living in Florida. The family provided a DNA sample and a DNA test confirmed that the victim indeed was Billy Feigner. Hurricane Sandy had destroyed all the photos from when Billy lived in Brooklyn, but his family was able to provide a photo from grade school. Determined to find answers, investigators tracked down people who had worked with Billy on the California ranch. It was found that while working at the ranch, Billy met a man named Forrest Ethington, who lived in the Dallas area. Forrest convinced Billy to join him and travel to Texas, where they would perform several robberies. The pair pulled some heist together in Texas, and then Billy decided to fly solo. However, Billy got caught and was set to go to court for the robbery. This worried Forrest because Billy might turn on him and reveal his robberies as well. Forrest then told the witness that he was going to try to kill Billy to silence him. Forrest then went to a remote part of the Texas ranch and shot Billy once in the back of the head. The detectives were all set to charge Forrest for Billy's murder. However, in January of 2020, detectives found out that Forrest was already dead. After Billy's death, while performing a heist at a coin shop in Pontigo, Texas, one of the members of the crew that Forrest had organized killed the owner of the shop. The FBI caught Forrest after he tried to sell the coins at a coin show. Forrest served five years in jail for the crime before appealing in 1991. In 2010, he was again arrested, this time for aggravated assault of a person under 18. He died in prison in October of 2019. Billy's disappearance and his murder was finally solved after 35 years, and although his family did not get the justice they so wanted, they got the closure they deserved. <laughs>